the gospel according to John and the gospel according to Matthew. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold auction sheep and doves and money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. Hmm. Someone said you should never get angry. Wow, well, huh? You gotta keep your anger in check, but there's a good kind of anger. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away, do not make, do not make my father's house a place of merchandise. Then the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 13, then Jesus went to the temple of God. He drove out all of those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. The word I'll be preaching this morning is the house of we are making mm. the house we are making you know I got pastor friends of mine that never use titles for their sermons I think you're missing such a great thing because if you just call me I'd give you a great title because I'm the expert of titles I got to tell you I like this one I come up on, on this all by myself I didn't google anything yeah huh I want you to lift your hands to the house of the Lord in this place. Father God, right now, I pray for a holy anointing. I pray for a victory. I pray for breakthrough. God, those of, those, of those, those of us that are sitting here this morning, those of us that are standing here in this place, dealing with a huge battle, dealing with some life-changing challenge, God, I'm asking you for breakthrough power. Those that are sick, I pray they'll be healed. Those that are under attack in their mind, that peace has abandoned them. God, I pray, I pray that peace would come rushing into their spirit. Oh, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, for a revival and a breakthrough and an outpouring. Let the river flow at Lighthouse Assembly of God in Richmond, Indiana. May we never remain the same in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you that I know, and I know in no uncertain terms, that the enemy is under our feet. He is bound. And God, you are delivering a word into this people today. Hallelujah. God, we give you honor and we give you praise and we love you and thank you. Let's give the Lord the greatest shout you've got in you right now, somebody. <laughs> you may be seated. It is so good to be with you today. I want to tell you that, that houses have a very important place in the heart of God. The word house is used over and over again in Scripture. It has several meanings. One is your body. It's the house. Um, it's the place that your soul and your spirit, the real you, dwells. The church is the house. Uh, the place of worship is the house. Um, family can be called a house we have responsibility over our house now I will note a couple things about our text today and it's this that Jesus went into the temple not once not twice but on three different occasions this occasion we read about in John's gospel, he sat down and very meticulously wove a whip, and he began after he made and created that whip, the, the holy indignation, the righteous anger was swelling up in him because he walked in the temple expecting to see one thing, and what he saw was not what he had in mind. 
And he took it personal. And let me make this very clear. I don't know if all of you really get this. But Jesus takes attendance at his house. He knows how many times you're in his house. And he knows how many times you ought to have been in his house. And he takes his house personally. He didn't say, it is written, your house should be called the house of prayer. He said, my house is called the house of prayer. But you have made it something it was never intended to be. If I said the words DIY, how many would identify you know what DIY means? It is do it yourself. Is it do it yourself? D-Y-I, right? How many have ever made a recipe? Have you ever done a project and made a recipe? You had a plan. You had the, the thought. You had what you know it ought to come out looking like. But after you got all done, it didn't turn out like the picture. And every once in a while, my wife will make me a picture, say, make this. And I'll get real close, except for a few minor details. Usually I make it a little bigger, because <laughs> I like big things. Come on, amen. And it's a little different, and sometimes we think, oh, that's not what I thought this should, should look like. It, it, it did not follow the script. It did not follow the plan. I did not play it to the T, and, and, and as a result, what I thought I was going to get, I didn't get. And do you know that's what Jesus was saying? He said, I thought when I created the church, I'd get one thing. I'd get people who are hungry. I'd get people who are excited. I'd get people who are praying. I'd get people who are passionate. I'd get a group of people who love me more than anything else. And so I'm going to go. And you know how important the temple was to Jesus on the very week he was to be crucified? He walked in the temple. He took time to get to God's house. And when he walked in, he was completely uh, dismayed and utterly disappointed in what he saw. He said, well, I was coming expecting one thing, but it doesn't look as though what I thought the house of God ought to be is what it ought to be. Let me tell you something. I wonder how many churches Jesus is walking into today throughout our world and throughout America, and he's saying, you have made this place something it was never meant to be. I'm talking about the house we are making. Let me make this clear. The church is what we make it. Come on now. And the church is what we have come up with. Now, it might be that Jesus would walk in and he would feel well at home here at Lighthouse. I hope he would come in and he would come in the front and he would sing and he would dance and he would rejoice and he would feel right at home. You know there's no place like home. Come on. I, I wish that Jesus could walk right in and say, oh, it feels good to be here with these folks today. They are getting it right. They are doing what I intended them to do. They have made this house what I wanted them to make it. And Jesus said, I wanted it to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves and merchandise and, and scoundrels and thieves and robbers. And he took a whip and he drove them out. He turned over the tables and he made all of them vacate the premise because he says, you have, you have disgraced a very sacred and holy place. Come on, church. Throughout America today, we have made the church to be everything but a house of prayer. We have made it to be, we have made it to be a place where we hang out and we get to know each other, and there's nothing wrong with getting to know each other. There's nothing wrong with talking. There's nothing wrong with having a good time. But I can tell you, when it's like the whistle sounding at work, when the music starts here at Lighthouse, it's time to focus our attention on Him and Him alone. Come on, somebody. I can tell you what's going on in here is more important than anything you got to say to anybody else in any part of the building. We need to get hungry and we need to get excited for the house of God. Now I said all the time there's no house there's no house like Lighthouse and if that's true the church that we have made it to be is because that's what we've created. If there's no house like Lighthouse, however kind of house it is, it's because we have made it that way. That is all on us. 
And it has been said that you deserve what you tolerate. Come on, church. And there is, there is, going, to be, there is going to be in any church a pastor who either deals with things or tolerates things. Amen. And so if the church is a place of gossip, it's because that's been tolerated. Hey, if the church is a place of backbiting and rumor and judgment and critical spirits, that's because that has been tolerated. I said, come on, pastor, preach it good this morning. If the church is boring, it's because we've tolerated that. If the church is indifferent and lukewarm and cold and just apathetic and complacent, that's because we put up with it. You deserve whatever you put up with. Come on. And there's got to be some times in your life, have you ever just made the statement, I'm not going to put up with that anymore. Come on, somebody. And as the pastor and shepherd of this flock, I am glad to announce to you that we are not a church of criticism. We are not a church of gossip. We are not a church of backbiting. We are not a church of critical spirits. We are not a church of apathy. We are not a church of complacency because we want to be a house that he's pleased with. And if there is no house like Lighthouse, there's got to be a unique and special and wonderful atmosphere. There's got to be something different. If there's no house like Lighthouse, how can we say that? Because we refuse to tolerate in our own selves sin and, and compromise and backsliding. It's within us that we say, I am dealing with my own transgressions and I'm going to be a person upright in the name of Jesus. A man of integrity, honesty, and purity. I'm not going to tolerate all that sin coming off in my life. I got no place for that. Well, I want Jesus to walk into my life and be pleased. I want him to say, this is what I had in mind when I made you. You look like the blueprint I, I had all envisioned. You're not something that I thought was going to be a handsome picture, and now you're Frankenstein. I, I said, you're not, I've called you to be a bride, and you look like a bridezilla. Uh-uh. He said, I want, to, I want to tell you that you are aligning yourself. You, are you hearing me preach this morning? You are getting yourself, and you are getting your church. You are preparing us for a place. You are preparing me for a place. When I come back from my own, I got no problem recognizing you. Hey, amen, somebody. I want to be a place and a house where Jesus is welcome in. Could you jump to your feet and welcome the King of Kings? Welcome the Savior of the world. Welcome the Lord of Lords. This is his house. Is he welcome in his own house? I want to deposit four words into your life this morning. I'd love for you to write these down. These are four things that Lighthouse will make itself to be. First of all, the church is what we make it. Number one, we must be a church of distinction. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, I'll put you over in Ezekiel, and he talks about how his, the priests have profaned holy things. He talks about how in the last days there will be a group of people that will make no distinction, watch this, between the clean and the unclean. They will make no distinction between the pure and the impure. They will not distinguish between the holy and the common. They will make no difference between what is right and what is wrong? They will, they will only go through the motions, and he says, I am profane among them. Even the pastors, the officials of that last day church, they will get, verse 27, they will become people who I can't rely on. There are people who, have, who become wolves, and they seize prey, and they shed blood, and they just do everything they can and her priests are profane among them. 
He said, I saw it for a man, Ezekiel 22 and 30. I saw it for someone. Let me tell you something, church. Let, let's say there are 100,000 churches here in America today having some kind of assembly together on the Lord's day. He is walking around and he's looking for one who will stand in the gap and make a hedge for me for the land. He said, look, I found none. I want him I want him to find at least one. I want Lighthouse Assembly of God. I want us to make this a church where he can count on us. Hallelujah. You know, it's so popular, and I hear I even hear preachers say this. I heard a preacher say this back in the fall, and I'm just now getting over it somewhat. I'm not completely over it, and I'll do everything I can, never hear him preach again, but... Um, <laughs> But he said, you ain't better than nobody. He's saying this to a church. He said, just because your marriage is, is between a, a man and a wife doesn't make you better than someone whose marriage is between the same sex. You ain't married to any. You, you, just because you're married and have the biblical marriage, you ain't better. And, and I, I thought, man, I hope my church never gets angry with me. I was looking for a brick to, to throw at the preacher. Come on, somebody. Now, it's popular. Look, it's popular to say you're not better than anybody else. I get that. You know, I understand that sentiment. I understand that we don't want to build up egotistical people who walk around pride and arrogant, acting like, well, you know, I'm just better than the world, and I'm just, you know, I'm just so superior. But I will make this very clear in no uncertain terms. I want you to hear me, that I may not in my own flesh be better than anybody because my sin has, will ruin me like it will ruin anybody else. And I am not good because I'm good. But I want you to hear me tell you this. The God in me is better than the God in them. 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And there is a distinction here at Lighthouse Assembly of God. If there is no distinction, if there's no transformation, if there's no before and after, how are we going to convince anybody to come over to our side? I mean, what leverage do we have if we cannot say that living for Jesus is better than living for the devil? Now, I know that I am not better than anyone else in my world. I know that there are people that have a lot more money. They have a lot better place to live. And they, have just a, they just have it better off in a lot of ways than I have. But I want you to hear this pastor tell you this morning, there's not one sinner in the world I trade places with. Could I get a stronger amen than that? You say, well, we're not better than anybody. I want you to look at, I want you to look at Proverbs 12 and 26. <laughs> the righteous, the Word of God says, is better or more excellent than his neighbor. Mm -hmm. There's something about the road that leads to heaven that I'm walking on <laughs> that gives me a victory, that gives me a peace. And before someone says, well, do you think you're better than me? You can say to them, no, I'm not better than you, but I'm better than the old me. I don't think I'm better than you, but I know I'm better than I was when I did not have Jesus as Lord. I don't think I'm walking around better than, I, than you, higher than I think I am, but I know one thing I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I'm on my way to heaven. I've got joy. I've got peace. I've got victory. And the road I'm on is better than the road you are on. You can take all your millions, all your billions, and it won't buy you one moment of peace. If you do not have the Lord, you will spend eternity, and there will not be one thing all that 
that money will buy to, to get you relief from one second of the torment, I would rather go to hell owing a few people a few bucks. I, I mean, I'd rather go to heaven. Yeah, hey, I'd rather go to heaven with some bills and some issues than go to hell with all the money in the world. Rockefeller died, and his accountant asked, how much money did he leave? And the accountant said, all of it, hey. I'm excited to announce to you today that there's a better way. And we've got to make a distinction. Look, light and dark cannot mix. We've got to make a distinction. We've got to say, look, we love you. We care about you. But if you are not obeying God's word, there's a better way for you. You don't have to go out like this. You don't have to live like this. You don't have to suffer through life. You don't have to continue being bound and being a slave. You can have freedom in your life. There is a better way. Jesus came to establish a better covenant, a better way. The, the only way to have peace is to have the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. So the church we are making, number one, is a church of distinction. Number two, a church of desperation. Hey, in Joshua's account of the walls of Jericho, one word, one idea becomes a focal point in my thinking as I read through this account. It was that people were tired of not getting what God said they could get. It was that people had heard about the promised land, the promised land, the promised land. They had heard how their forefathers lived in Egypt as slaves to Pharaoh for 430 years. They had heard about how for 40 years they trekked across the desert in circles and their rebellion kept them out. Their moms and their dads died. Now we have a Joshua generation that said, you know, I'm tired of all the talk. I want to do some walk. Come on now. I believe we have a generation that's just tired of all the rhetoric, tired of all the pep talks, tired of all the speeches, tired of all the sermons, tired of all the messages, tired of all the lessons, and nothing's getting done. I will promise you today that we've got to be a church that is willing to march around what God says is ours till the walls come down and we can claim it by a victorious shout that God heard our cry. When he comes and visits our church, whenever we gather together, I got one prayer. My wife can, can answer this. Any of you who have ever prayed with me can answer this. I am calling out, God, can we be hungry? Can we be desperate? The walls of Jericho did not fall until a desperate group of people got into obedience and began to march around and say through the victory that is ours we are going to claim the promise of God that he said can be ours. Hallelujah. Woo! I thought about that little woman with the issue of blood how for 12 years she spent all she had and she got weaker, she grew worse she, had, she was out of money, no doctor could help her and the Bible is clear that Jesus touched her. But the Bible is also clear that she touched him. I said the Bible is clear that Jesus touched her. And the word is clear that she touched him. My question is, who touched who first? You hear me tell you today, she touched him. <laughs> she reached out to him first. She pressed through all the obstacles first. She said, if I can touch the hem of his garment first. He was in the crowd, unaware that she was even there. But she forced her way through strong, able-bodied men and said, I am going to touch. If I can get a hold of a thread, a hem of his garment, I will be made whole. It was after she touched him that, that virtue flowed from him and healed her. And he said, after she touched him, daughter, your faith has made you whole and we need to stop saying oh God touch me oh God do something for me oh God I'm asking you to give me this we need to focus our energy on touching him and reaching him and making it a priority to be hungry for him and to be a church of desperation for him and when we get desperate enough that nothing's going to get in the way that nothing's going to stand between us and we say I will not stop till I get uh, to the place I 
I can touch him, when I touch him, I get all the touch I'll ever need from him. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise. The quote is this. Desperate times require desperate me measures. We got to get desperate. Do you realize that our world is so desperate? They are so desperate, they have no idea that they're desperate. They are so lost in a reprobate mind, a lost, sinful state, that they don't even care about the things of God. They know that judgment may come if they do this, but they still do it. Come on, church. And they celebrate it, and they should be ashamed of it. We, I hope you know. I hope you know. Listen, if I'm not the world's greatest news buff because for one reason, I, I like victory better than depression. But I pick up on enough of the big stuff throughout the day to realize that Look, if all, of you are, if all of you do is sit around and watch the news all day long, you're more spiritual and holy than I am to keep the victory. You don't need 24-hour news to know that our world is desperate. Our world is so desperate. The point is they are desperate for their sin more than we've been desperate for Jesus. I asked the question a moment ago, will you host the Holy Ghost? Will Lighthouse be a place of desperation? Now listen to me. How many of you can say, I know I need to get more desperate for Jesus this year than I was last year? Shout amen. amen. Everyone shout amen. amen. Now here's the deal. Friday night we are kicking off 2016 outpouring. And I promise you, that I love all of the folks that will be coming. But the man that's coming this week is a very close and dear companion and, and friend of mine. And he is pastoring the second best church in Indiana. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that two of the most passionate Pentecostal churches where the pastor and the worship team's not afraid to talk in tongues over the, over the microphone, one sitting on the west side of the state on I-70 and one sitting on the east side of the state on I-70. Just like, just like one or two miles over here, you're in Ohio where Pastor Keith Taylor's church is, one or two miles, you're in Illinois. I praise God that he has strategically placed him at the west. He strategically placed us at the east. We're the eastern gate of outpouring and God wants to flow in this church, not for our glory, not for our credit, not for our name, but he's looking, he's just looking for a church that's hungry. He's just looking for somebody that will say, I know it's Friday night, and I usually have pizza, or I usually have tacos. I tell you, God forbid, if you miss a taco night, you could go without one. Come on. You don't need to watch another senseless movie. You need to shut the TV off. You need to come in your work clothes. It doesn't matter. But this Friday night, don't let it anything keep you from missing the powerhouse apostle prophet pastor Keith Taylor he is going to be on fire and we're going to have us a Holy Ghost River and we'll be swimming out of this place I won't be surprised if someone had to have a designated driver God is going to pour his power out but we need to come and we need to make his presence a priority there's another word we're making our church. We're making our church to be a place that knows how to make a difference. Look, has Lighthouse, has your involvement in this church, has it made any kind of difference in your life? I know I'm going to start all over on that pu pu pukey amen. Just forget that. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Has Lighthouse and your involvement in Lighthouse turn to someone and say, get your amen already. Has this church made a difference in your life? I want, look, I know we got people here today struggling with stuff. I know we've got people here today that you've lived a, a week that you're not proud of. 
I know there's somebody here today that you wish you could change. You wish you didn't have to continue in this pattern. But you're here today. And my question is, why are you here today? Are you here today because it's a good thing or because someone invited you or because you're trying to turn over a new leaf? Or are you here because God got you here because he entrusts us with the power and the authority that you can change and that we, by his grace, can make a difference in your life? Jude 22 says, and some have a compassion making a difference. Look, I want to be a church that makes a difference. I'm not interested at all, never have been, never will be, of being one of those pastors that just says, I love you just the way you are. I love you just the way you are. I love you just the way you are. I really do. And I love you if you don't change. But change. You didn't come to Jesus to stay the same. I've seen people not challenged to change, and they brought their system from the world, and they worked their game in the house. I've seen people that were complainers. They wouldn't change, and now they come to the church complaining. I see people, I've seen people flirting and, and running, running games um, on people, uh, trying to manipulate them out in the world, and no one said to them, you're not permitted to do that here. And they run their system in the church, and innocent people get hurt. I've seen people, come on, I've seen people gossip. They brought that old attitude in here, and if we don't say that's not permitted here, we're not tolerate. That's not the church we're making. That's not what we're after. We're not going for that. That's not what we have in mind. What we have in mind is a group of people that are interested in growing, that are interested in not staying the same, that want to, that want to be challenged, that want to reach, that want to go farther, that want to jump higher, that want to do great things for God, that want our lives to count. That's what we are going for here. And if you bring that system in the church, you bring your old life in the church, and no one says to you, you don't have to live that way for example what if we have a drug dealer that's dealing drugs out in the street and he comes to church would you think it would be okay for me to permit him to be out in the foyer passing out drugs and collecting a couple bucks then why do we permit people with issues with their mouths all the time got something to say and it's usually not positive come on This is what you call, get ready, good preaching. We've got to go on record and say we can make a difference in your life. If you were negative, you can be positive. If you were afraid, you can have confidence. If you were a chicken, you can be bold. Amen. God wants to do great things in your life. Yes, he does. He wants his place to be a place that makes a difference. Now, this is a tall order. I said we're going to be a place that is distinguished. We're going to be a place that says right is right, wrong is wrong, hell is hot, heaven is a place. We're going to make, we're going to make it clear, we're going on record, that we are going to distinguish between the pure and the... And the listen, let me put it this way. If I had the world's most tastiest meal, I mean, the kind of meal these hoity-toity chefs fix, you know, to me, I'm not fancy. I call, I call fancy meal a hamburger with two slices of cheese on it. That's all the fancy I need. Come on. Well, I know some of you like the fancy stuff. How many like fancy meals once in a while? You like the hoardy toy, the little, little bitty things, you know, a little, it costs about $40 for a little piece of something. Let's have, let's have a, a meal here. Let's have a meal here with fine china and the cloth and all the stuff and filet mignon and lobster and shrimp and all the goodies. It's just the most fanciest meal one can think of on this table. Watch this. And on this table have a pile of dung. We cannot be the kind of people that say, I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to appear to be judgmental. So I'm not going to say which is one is better than the other. I'm just not going to say it. I just refuse. I'm just, I'm just that way. I'm just not going to have that. I'm just not going to be judged that way. Because if, look, if someone wants to eat dung, that's their privilege. In fact, let's have a church of dung eaters. Dung eater assemblies. Come on. 
I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say that the filet mignon is going to taste better than the dung. No, pastor's going to say it. No, lighthouse is going to say it. We're going to say it. We're going to say there's taste and see that the Lord is good, and then sin is like dung. It's garbage. You got no business pulling up to a table of road apples. Come on now. (laughs) Hallelujah. I just now thought of that. That's a good one. What if I'd have worked on it for a while? What if I had to illustrate a sermon? Oh, I woke you up. Mm -hmm. We're going to be a place of desperation and we're going to be a place that makes a difference but in 2016 listen God wants us to do much more as a church than to make the best out of a bad situation he wants us to change the situation we're not going to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves oh dear God what a tough way we've got it. But, oh, we're just victims here. We're picked on. We're persecuted. We're abandoned. All the things are happening to the church. No, we're going we're gonna to strap a, 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 a weapon of warfare into our body, and we're going to say there is a shield of faith here. And we are not going to allow the fiery darts to penetrate that shield. And we are going to go into combat with confidence that if God is on our side, who can be against us? And we are going to win. How are we going to do these things? i I got a question. How are we going to do these things? By making Lighthouse a place that makes disciples. I want you to hear me. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, go into all this world and make disciples. He came and he said, Go into all the world and make disciples. I want to give you a phrase, and I want you to hear me. We make disciples. I want you to stand with me your feet, and three times in a row, we're going to, with our hand held high, we're going to declare. Now, this is the church that we are making we are going to put the phrase, we make disciples. Are you ready? We make disciples. We make disciples. We make disciples. Now give the Lord a shout of praise, everybody. As you remain standing, I want to ask you something. Do you know what that means? The Bible did not say go into all the world. Jesus did not command to go into all the world and make converts. Because I got to tell you, in all the years that I've pastoring, one is easier than the other. I mean, we, we can get people saved. We can bring people to the altar. There is, at, there is atmosphere in this place. And there are people here today that you need to get born again. You, you know that you're not ready for heaven. You're not ready to stand before a righteous, holy God. And I want to get you converted. I want to make a, in your life a defining moment where a difference was made. And I know there's a devil saying right now, you can't do it. You can't do it. It's impossible. Someone said, living for Jesus is hard. No, it's not hard. It's impossible. If you don't have him helping you, you won't do it. But he'll help you do. He'll help you win victori- victoriously in this life. But you got to begin. you got to begin through confession and through humility. But then there's another thing that we're going to focus on. And I want you to hear me. How many of you, uh, just, uh, if, if you just give me, bear with me another moment. How many of you, um, if you were told to make something out of wood, you would not know where to start? Where are you? You, you just would not have any clue at all. Okay, because I can do a little bit of that. So if I take this young man right here, and I take him to my shop, where there are a lot of sharp, fast-moving tools, 
and I say, all right, Clayton, there's the wood, there's the shop. I want a china cabinet. I'll be back to check on you. He'll walk in this way and walk out this way. And it won't be walnut stain staining the floor. Do you know we do that with people? We say, oh, you'd like to make something? Well, there's the shop. There's the tools. You want to serve Jesus? Well, there it is. Good luck. I'll catch you later. But if he really wants to make something, the way he'll do it is me coming beside him, hand in hand. Now we do this. Now we do that. Then we cut here. Then we sand here. Then we glue here. Then we clamp here. Then we sand here. Then we put that on there. We screw that. We nail that. We touch up that. We do that. We touch it up again. We stain it. We varnish it. We finish it. We we sand it. We do it some more. There you go. See, see what he's nodding his head? He's learning. We are, we are hand in hand. That's called making a disciple. It's not enough to say, welcome the family of God. Have at it. And Lighthouse... You hear me tell you, if it's the last thing we do, we're going to get a lot better at this. Because some of you never had anyone show you the ropes and you wish you did. How many of you consider yourself a very strong Christian? I promise you, most of you had somebody come alongside of you to teach you what they were doing is discipling you. We make disciples. Today I got two requests as you bow your heads. How many are here today and you just know that you're not interested at all in 2016 being the same? You, you know you know there's something better for you than how you've been living. You understand that. Would you raise your hand across this church? Wow. Yes. Yes. Question number two. How many of you can name somebody last year please listen to me, be honest, that you showed how to serve Jesus. You discipled them. You took them under your wing. You made their progress very personal to you. And they are a strong, solid, fruitful Christian today because of your personal investment last year. You can name at least one. Would you raise your hand? About 12 hands were raised. So look up here. No guilt attached to this. I'm just making a point. We had about 12 people say they made a disciple last year. How many believe God spoke to me on this theme then? And we're not just going to hear the word. We're going to do the word. We're going to put tools in your hands. Sunday school is a tool. Wednesday night life groups are a tool. The preaching of God's words is a tool. Outpouring is a tool. The materials we give you, the preaching that I'm going to move into beginning next week, showing you how. How many of you, if you knew how to make a disciple, you'd be more excited about it? We're going to do just that. I would like everyone to walk the altar. Let's, let's just have a moment. Church, come around the altar. Let's sing and worship the Lord for a moment. Let's get desperate in this, in this last moment of this service. Right before we receive our offering, I want us to lift up our hearts, lift up our hands. Everyone come and get around this altar. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you.